Hey, hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Project Freelance. This is season five. My name is Kay Nagonio, and if you have never heard my voice before, well, welcome to Project Freelance. If you're coming back to join us for another week of Project Freelance, thank you so very much. I've been seeing your ratings. I've been seeing all those stars you've been giving this podcast and all the feedback you've been giving it down below. Hey, if you haven't given the podcast feedback yet, please do me a favor and go down below this podcast and leave a little bit of feedback so that other potential listeners can find this podcast, look at those reviews and say, hey, I should check this podcast out too, because that's probably what you did when you clicked on Project Freelance, right? So welcome back to another week. This week on the podcast, we have Tyler and Fredo from Caliber TV. Listen, if you don't know who Caliber TV is, you need to you need to get back on YouTube, man. So Caliber TV has been making live music videos for mm, years now, five years, five, six years now. And I've been following these guys from the very beginning when they were making, you know, mediocre live music videos. And now they're making badass 4K quality sound mixed just they've pulled out all the stops and they've made these amazing live music videos they're very heavy in the rock and metal world they're trying to branch out into edm and hip-hop now and in the future they want to just continue to grow caliber tv into something that is you know almost like mtv except how mtv is supposed to be music television so caliber tv is trying to become the next mtv if you will and I've wanted to talk to these guys for a while, and I helped them out a little bit at the very last Vans Warp Tour, filming a little bit of footage, drum cam footage and for uh, Wage War, and I filmed a wide angle shot for 1OK Rock set so that Caliber could turn those live sets into full videos and put them up on YouTube. So we get into everything that has to do with creating content at live shows, how to get into live shows, how to even get permission to get into live shows. And uh, we give you some tips, some tricks, and there's a whole lot of information in this podcast that I think you're going to get a kick out of. Before we get started with Project Freelance, I just want to let you guys know that my book, my first photography book, No Tracers, An Urban Explorer's Diary, is now available for pre-order. Uh, I'm actually sending the final draft to the printers, so if you pre-order one of those, they will be mailed out to you in the month of August. So, thank you for everyone who has ordered one of those books. I've sold five so far. Listen, five is more than I thought I was going to sell. I'm getting 25 ordered, so my goal is to sell these 25. That's the first kind of goal I want to do. Overall, I would like to sell over 200 copies of this book. Most books don't print, don't sell 250 copies, you know, so I kind of want to see if I can push this thing a little bit. So if you guys want a copy of No Tracers and Urban Explorer's Diary, it will come signed and it will come signed with a, uh, a photography print from the book. So thank you guys for buying those if you have and if you have not go ahead and do so like i said i'm only getting 25 printed for this first run so if you want one snatch one up before they're gone otherwise let's just jump right into this podcast uh first of all we start off with tyler and then fredo comes in about 40 minutes later at the end of the podcast to ask him a couple a couple of questions that uh tyler didn't really know the answer to or he just wanted fredo to answer those questions because fredo in fact did start caliber tv so, without further ado, let's get into this podcast. Let's talk about creating live music content. Sweet. Also, I just smoked a little weed, so if I ramble, I apologize. <laughs> oh, sweet. Let me take a dab really quick. Okay, yeah, go for it. I got my email actually on. <laughs> oh, shit. So it's okay, just, so it's It's ready. already at the temp. It's yeah. ready. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, give it a rip. You know the caliber, boys. We're fucking loaded out of our minds. <laughs> That's what makes it so fun to work with you guys, because there's, like, no pressure. Yeah, exactly. A plus, every single video that we've ever done, we've been stoned out of our mind. <laughs> Dude, can we talk about That's that? That's why they're so goddamn good. Can we talk about sure. that on the podcast? Fuck yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. We're doing it. We're doing it. My name is Tyler Dagoni, and um, I work with Caliber TV. I also am a freelance um, videographer slash cinematographer and graphic artist um so basically i guess if we're get, gonna get into where like i started yeah um my mom was actually a graphic designer um when i was growing up so when i was like in second 
third grade, maybe first grade, I used to sit and watch my mom use like the very first version of Photoshop. So I used to watch her create all of our stuff for our school. She also worked at like a printing and graphic design place. Um, so I got it really early. So my mom basically gave me Photoshop one year with a computer and I just started going ham. I was probably 12 when I started using Photoshop. I started out doing mobile app development like designs like um in high school the jailbreak scene was like really large um and i used to create icons and themes and i sold them on cydia and i made a shit ton of money one summer so that was cool (laughs) that's amazing holy crap yeah jailbreaking used to be like all the rage i was like 15 and my parents let me put it under their name so because uh, you couldn't make money off the Cydia store unless you were over 18. So um, my parents just put it under their name, and I sold um, I sold a complete iOS retheme called UI Refresh. And it was when um, Apple introduced all the gloss into the iPhone where every icon had a fucking shiny gloss. <laughs> like yeah. everything had a gloss. I went through and cleaned 2,000 images and remade over 2,000 operating system images and created a theme. They removed all of that. What? Which was, yeah. And I sold it. I sold it for like $2 on Cydia. And in a month, I made like $500. Wow. It was was the coolest thing as a 15-year-old because I was just like, holy shit, this is more money than I know what to do with. I'm 15. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Holy yeah, crap. I think I got some cool games out of that and, you know, probably bought some movies or whatever. <laughs> That's crazy. I've known you for years and I had no idea that you did that, that you used to do that kind of stuff. That's crazy. Man. I still have a Deviant Art page where I actually have all that stuff just sitting there. Um, you can still see all the themes and everything. I eventually released it for free because. Um, when the OS update came, I like basically was just like, um, I'm not going through 2,000 more images because they changed like the file names because of jailbreak and stuff. Um, so I just released it for free in case anyone else wanted to modify my original work and keep it going. Wow. So you, you basically tesla your own design. Yeah, exactly. You were like, here, it's open. If anybody wants to improve upon it, please go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I love that. I used to do a lot of cool shit like that. Like, um, I know I'm like straying from subject, but um, I used to do ported video games. I used to create wine, use like a wine wrapper um, to allow Macs to play PC games. And I used to create ports that people could just like throw their CD into their computer, open this little program, and it would install it and run it like a virtual um, operating system. You could just double click it and play any game you wanted. How? (laughs) What? Yeah. How did you Um, figure this out? I was a part of a website called Mac. I think it was Mac porting or like Mac ported games or something and they had tools that allowed you to do it it was pretty difficult because a lot of games just didn't want to run in it and they had like like fucking a thousand different versions (laughs) like literally a thousand different versions of wine and like certain versions worked with certain games so like you would go through a database and you'd find like what other people were reporting on whether this game whether they were able to get it to work And I just started fiddling with it. I would install the games in through the wrapper, and then it would have like a bug reporting system that would tell you when there were errors. And it also had a system to install other software alongside the game that the game needed to run. So like I did a a pretty popular called Path of Exile. It's like a free dungeon crawler like Diablo. And I basically um, – I got to their forums, and it was pinned on the top of their forum as like an unofficial, like official release. Wow. And 
for years I ran that and then now other people take it. Like I, I just uploaded my thing and stopped doing it and they still have a Mac port on that forum today. Just fucking wow. crazy. That's crazy. Wow. So let's go to cinematography. When did you per- first pick up a camera? When did uh, film become part of your life? I kind of, I mean, I filmed here and there growing up, um, different things, but I never was really like serious into it. Um, and I guess it's worth mentioning that I watched a shit ton of live concert videos, a ton of them growing up. Like I would watch Slipknot big day out videos because I'm a huge Slipknot fan, and I would watch System of a Down videos, yeah. and I'd watch Psycho, that video of Psycho yeah. from Big Day Out. Yeah. I think it's 2004. That's how many times I've watched it. <laughs> and I might be wrong. I might need to check that. But, um, yeah, I I literally just used to watch them and dream of going to concerts. And then I met Fredo. Um, I was going to a ton of concerts a uh, little bit before I got out of high school and after I got out of high school. Um, I think I went to like five Bring Me the Horizon concerts in like a summer. They were playing San Fran so often. And um, I ended up meeting Fredo. And I think I met him at a Bring Me the Horizon show. It might have been an ish. No, not issues. It would have been like a Woe Is Me show or like wow. a – it might even have been – it might have been in a Mice and Men show. I don't know. It was like – I want to say that I met him in 2013 because – let's see. Yeah, it had to be 2013. That could have been Issues. It could have been. I think could it have might been. have actually. It might have been Issues. Because I saw Issues in uh, 2014 on that of Mice and Men tour, which if yeah. you're a year off, it could be that one. It could be. Um, but anyways, I, it, I think that was actually the show that I met up with him. So I think I met him at a show before and he needed a photographer to come and shoot with him. Fredo had just barely started caliber the year before 2012. And, um, he was at the time doing like cell phone videos, just like attending shows and filming with his cell phone and uploading and he started getting traction on it and he created like a little intro that super super old little box tv and um from there uh he ended up meeting me and sam um and basically uh i started doing the graphic design and he's um Sam and I both started filming. So at that point, we had three people. Um, we weren't necessarily getting gigs that often at the beginning. Um, and then it was just like wildfire. Like basically, we were out like three, four nights a week filming shows in Sacramento. Wow. Um, there was a venue called uh, Assembly. And we became really good friends with uh, the owner there. Um, we're still super good friends today. He uh, also works at Artery, or I think he used to. He might still. Um, but he works at Ace of Spades. And um, he would he would let us come through. Uh, we would get the permission from the bands and the publicists. And he would let us do whatever the heck we wanted. And no other venue was like that. No other venue would allow us to bring in three cameras and go in the green room and hang out with bands and shoot people and stand on stage and film, you know? And it may have took taken us like, you know, 20 shows or something, but eventually we were – we pretty much could do anything there. And it was – that was like where we really started like growing because – we were filming so often, and at that point, I will say that we were not very good at what we were doing. <laughs> so um, that's why we were filming like four bands a night, and we were like releasing them like next day. We would just cut them together, and we didn't even know what color grading was. We were just some bunch of amateurs just, you know, having fun. So um, 
I guess from there, um, we just kept filming. And uh, over time, we ended up getting better and better. Um, we started a website, which was really cool. Um, we started getting people to write for us, and we had photographers um, all over the U.S., friends of ours, um, people that we met who ended up shooting underneath us, and we became like a publication for them. Uh, Fredo still does that, where he emails out for shows for people and gets people gigs, and we have galleries on the website. Um, let's see. I don't know. What else? Let's see. You have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Uh, when when you first went from being in the crowd to being backstage on stage, you know, these different places that most people don't get to go. What was that like for you? Like that transition? Like, did you did you realize what was happening or was it just kind of natural? Um, it kind of just like it felt like I was not supposed to be there. <laughs> like. <laughs> Not really, but sometimes like we'd go to the venue and like we'd open up the door and like walk past the security guard and just feel it'd be like weird at first. It was just really weird that we were like going into the backstage area. Um, over time, it became more natural and it just like it just has to do with confidence. Um, I think a, a lot of it just comes with time and doing it, but like. First time I walked onto a stage to set up a camera, I felt so awkward. I felt like everyone <laughs> was staring at me. And now I just rush on the stage, do my thing, set it all up, and get the heck off. Um, but I mean, like, it used to be where I'd have, like, someone else come up with me. Because I didn't want, like, if someone had questions or, like, the band, you know, like, um, needed to be talked to and I felt like... I didn't know them or whatever. Like it was usually like me and Fredo would go up and set up the GoPro together. And then if anyone needed to talk to us, they would, you know, but now it's like we've been doing it for so long that it like, it's just second nature at this point. You just deal with it as it comes. <laughs> I'm sure it's the same way for photographers where they feel like completely weird the first time they go on stage. Yeah, I think that's a very normal feeling. I mean, you do feel like you're not supposed to be there because, I mean, like, you, they're not there to watch you. They're, they're there to watch the band, and you just have to be this, like, invisible thing that's on stage, you know? So for people that don't know how to reach out to publicists or how to reach out to bands to get permission to film live shows or photograph live shows – not all venues are just going to let you walk in with a camera, you know, sometimes you have to go through the venue. So what is the process? Who do you reach out to? Where do you find their email? Like, you know, how, what is the process of getting into a live show with a camera? Well, I will say that Alfredo does all of that. Same with uh, AK who runs BVTV. Um, I have never once ever reached out to anybody, but I will say that a majority of the time, it's just finding publicist emails on their Facebook page. I mean, 90% of bands have their publicist or have their general manager or their TM or whatever just listed on their Facebook. And that's a great place to start. And when you're, when you're looking for a contact, like if you're a photographer or a videographer and you're trying to get in contact with someone, hitting up someone's publicist is probably your best like option. I mean – especially just starting out, like someone's going to reply to you, you know? Um, I mean, I, I have never personally ever emailed anybody. Fredo kind of runs that whole side of caliber, but, um, yeah, I mean, information is out there. There are groups for publicists too. Like there are, uh, photography groups, photojournalism groups on Facebook and, you can reach out to people and ask like, hey, you know, like this band, like they're I don't think they have the same publicist anymore. And someone will reach out and say like, oh, yeah, they got a different publicist. Here's their email, you know. So there's like a huge support system within the whole entire music scene in general, as well as like the the photojournalism and people just, you know, like to share information. It helps them and it helps other people. Which is really cool. 
when Fredo gets there, I might put him on the spot and ask him how he goes about uh, doing all that stuff if he wants to get on here. Yeah, definitely. When did it go from just doing it to do it to getting paid to do it? You know, when did that come into play? When when did you guys start like seeing seeing a change and seeing a profit off of this? Never. <laughs> no, straight up. We don't make money right now. Um we put more money into caliber than we make. We do it purely out of passion. Um we want it to be money. Heck yeah, we want it to be money. Um, but I will say the first time that we ever did make money doing it was Vans Warp Tour 2016. I mean, before that, we would do local bands. Like, local bands would hit us up, and we would film them, and we charged, like, $75 a song or something, like, stupidly, ridiculously small. <laughs> you know, every artist starts out that way where they feel like – they're not worth charging that much or whatever, or they're hesitant to charge people. But, um, you know, we used to do local bands and we would make some money that way. We've all worked jobs like normal jobs. Uh, we all currently still work normal jobs. It's why our videos sometimes take a while to come out. Um, also it's a big editing process, but back to the topic at hand, um, it was Warp 2016 that we first made money, and we actually – the year before, we drove out all the way out to Arizona to film Asking Alexandria 2015 with um, Dennis Stoff. Dennis Stoff was getting on the stage for like the first time, like performing in front of a massive crowd, and our friend AK um, – he actually, the guy who runs BBTV, um, used to like manage Dennis um, way back in the day. So he was, uh, he's really good friends with Dennis, and he just reached out to Dennis and was like, you know, we're thinking about driving all the way out there, and we would love to film it. And we did. We drove all the way to Arizona, and on our way out, we said, can you believe if next year we were on the tour and we got paid for it. Like that would be so cool. And then next year, that's exactly what we did. We um, set up an appointment with uh, uh, Kevin and um, Steph Mursky, who work at uh, Warp Tour. And we went down. Um, well, I, I should say, first of all, our friend uh, Timmy Kayum, who's a photographer, um, went and did the actual first meeting with them. We had some uh, email talking with them um, about possibly filming. And then because Tim lived in L.A. Um, – well, not in L.A., but he lives around L.A. Um, he was able to go and meet up with them at Warped uh, headquarters. So he went up and met with them and presented them with all of our data – uh, like our analytics of like how well our videos were doing on our own. Um, and at that point we had like, I don't know, maybe a couple million collective views on our channel and AK's channel probably like three, five times more, you know. Um, his channel's been, you know, eight years in the making now and ours is six. So rightfully so, he has more. But... Uh, we presented them with our statistics, and they were really impressed by our videos. They were also impressed that our – not only was our video great, our audio, um, even at the time, it wasn't the best, but it was a lot better than a majority of the people doing live videos. I mean a majority of it is just a board feed that's meant to go into a live audience's ears – broadcasted you know like it's it's meant to go into massive subwoofers and just like there's meant to be like there's things that aren't replicating back into ears or through a laptop or through a phone it just doesn't sound right so a lot of people you know like that's how they do it like they just hook up the board straight to the feed and you know they broadcast it through or they set up some mixing but the mixing isn't quite done right so 
that's why we do everything in post because post allows us to, you know, get things done afterwards. Um, but basically, uh, we talked with them and, uh, Warped was actually going to hire um, Yahoo again that year. They used Yahoo the last year for the live streams, um, and they decided to go with us. They went. Um, they did the first day live streaming with Yahoo. Um, so, you know, normally they had a lot more bands and they had a lot more, you know, streams going on, and they did a lot less. And we did. What we had on our schedule was 46 videos that summer, and uh, that was the first time that we would be making money. Um, we kind of, you know, we didn't we didn't go out there and just like try to make a ton of money. We did it for a reasonable per, reasonable price, and um, I think we walked away with like a thousand five hundred bucks or something after three months of work. But um, it was it was a huge stepping point for us because that was when we really like we were feeling like we were finally being taken serious, you know, like w like now we can do anything that kind of feeling, you know, it was like we've done warp tour like, you know, like we can try other things like we can try to do DVDs or we can try to do festivals um, and we'd never filmed the festival in our life before that. So. Wow. It was a it was a huge thing like we I I remember just preparing for months for Warp Tour like literally just going on Amazon and ordering things and just staying up late nights um and we actually had like um like the craziest editing experience of my life for Warp Tour that year because we had um we had to get all the videos approved they had to be sent in to Warp to be emailed back out to the bands and the publicists in order for them to also approve it. So, um, which is is really tough when the tour is ongoing mm -hmm. and we start at the beginning and we go, you know, five six days out on the tour and then fly back home to get working on them we're already like this the tour has already started so the longer it takes us the you know the more likely that the advertising won't help the tour and that was our main thing is we want these to go out and help push people in there get people you know coming to see their favorite bands or seeing new bands that they've never seen before so you know we filmed 46 videos and um fredo was cutting like the wind just cutting as many videos as possible. I don't know how many he was doing per day, but he finished before I did. Um, I was color grading three videos a day, and I was um, I was awake twenty hours a day for two weeks straight, and um, I actually would get to the point. Where I just felt like I was gonna freak out. And I go, I need to go to bed. <laughs> and I just, I would run into my room and I would f pass out and I would set an alarm for four hours. I would set an alarm for four hours and I'd pass out and I'd wake back up and I'd get right back to editing. And um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I just relate <laughs> so hard to it. I need to go to bed. <laughs> exactly. I need to go to bed. I'm gonna die. <laughs> but it was. It was legit two weeks because there it was supposed to be a different process. We um, it was supposed to be a much smoother editing process. But uh, what happened was we had hired another guy who uh, came to film with us, and um, we also were supposed to have him doing the color grading because um, he had always done really good color grading work, and we always admired his stuff. So we hired him for that. And um, he ended up um, going on tour with somebody right after Warp Tour. Um, I guess I don't know if he didn't get the memo, but um, basically told us, I can't do it. I don't have an internet connection. I can't do it. Branding, the animation work, because we did all the song titles that like pop up in the corner, and I had to make those all in After Effects. So I was like bumping out 
tons of graphics. So I was supposed to be doing that while he was color grading and he was supposed to be sending me his color grades and I was supposed to be slapping on the final animation and doing the final export. But that uh, didn't happen as planned. Um, so we ended up uh, doing it – like I ended up doing the color grading as well as the animations. Wow. And it just – it was just insane. Like I was – like I said, it was 20 hours a day, three videos a day, and that's what I was bumping out. And you, if you watch those 2016 videos, like yes, I wasn't as good at color grading back then as I am now with the newer videos. But – I was rushing the heck out of those, but they look great. Like I was, I was making sure those videos were as polished as humanly possible without me killing myself. You know, um, God, I've been rambling so long. <laughs> no, dude, this is, this is what podcasts are all about. It's all about storytelling and like talking about your experience. Cause this is what people want to hear. I mean, I want to hear this stuff. Like, you're, I'm also learning shit from you, like so on Warp Tour because I mean I I did Warp Tour 2017 and like talk about that tour like it's a beast like what is that experience like? It's really hot. It's um it's literally drink water or pass out. Um, but it's amazing. It's it's absolutely amazing. Like the the atmosphere of Warp Tour is just like the biggest summer camp slash I don't know like family occasion like everybody's just your family like you get to know people there that you normally wouldn't be friends with or maybe not necessarily wouldn't be friends with but that you normally wouldn't talk to you know <laughs> like I met so many people at Warp Tour just chilling next to people just hanging out like even before we started filming Warp Tour it was just hanging out you know like going and listening to bands meeting people and having a good time like crowd surfing with somebody and like getting a picture of them and sending it to them and then just becoming friends you know like it's just the coolest thing ever and then working it is just like it's just like that i mean obviously you're not crowd surfing i mean you can't <laughs> i did but I did. um <laughs> 2017 actually um speaking of that i went uh we were in vegas and it was so hot that i was absolutely dying the bands that we were supposed to film were supposed to all be inside in the air conditioning of the hard rock hotel and they got moved outside multiple bands got moved outside including like gore and a couple other bands because gore was spraying fake blood and um hard rock wouldn't let them spray the fake blood inside because it would take them hours to clean it up and they had i don't know if they had something going on the next day or something but um so we were outside on the hot pavement in like 116 degrees weather or like heat and um it was it was nasty it was just like it was so hot and i remember finishing filming i don't know what band i finished filming but i started walking over they had a pool that was they went up to a stage and icy stars was playing on the stage and people were literally just moshing in the pool and i walk over to a random merch tent and i just ask hey can i put all my camera gear here and go jump in that pool and the girl goes, sure, I'll watch your stuff. And I rip off my shirt and just dive in there. And it was the best day of my life. And that's that's Warp Tour in a nutshell. Literally anything can happen. Even even a pool with icy stars playing. It's pretty <laughs> tight. I mean, where else are you going to find something like that? Nowhere. Yeah, and the way I explain it to people is like Warp Tour is all of the introverts – get together in one place and they just are introverted together and it forces them to hang out with each other. And it's the greatest exactly. thing that you could ever do. It's the most therapeutic thing that you exactly. can literally do. It's amazing. It seriously is. And music just brings everybody together. I mean, 
it's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about um, how you guys construct these videos. Like, what do you, how are you setting up your shots? Where are you putting cameras? Like, what are you looking for when it comes to live music videos? Well, I would say when it comes to like live performances, um, a lot of it is us pre planning ahead of schedule. Um, except when it's like venues that we know really well when we know like when we shoot at places consistently like if we're not bringing in new people we have our angles down um the main people who film with us we all have a set of lenses that we use that are our standards for videos we have our like our wide uh like our wide zoom that can pull tight as well as be out. Um, we have like a closer shot. We have um, generally like a a super wide on stage. Um, I mean, if you watch the videos, you'll see it. We've got a back angle that's got a long zoom. Um, but when we go out and we do things like, like Warp Tour just this past uh, weekend, um, we had two new people filming with us, um, and they had never filmed with us before. And we also had a third person um, who's just recently started filming with us. And um, we had to figure out everything like a week in advance because we needed to – like we rented gear. We rented out lenses, and we had um, – people with different bodies like that's the thing about all the caliber videos is they're all different camera bodies they're just color graded to look the same um but we're working with like like four or five different camera companies probably like four um and um we have different lenses and mounts so like we have to make sure that certain people have a, a lens that we would need. So like one of the guys, he had a 50 millimeter, um, you know, which is like a pretty good range. Um, and he also had, I think a 16. So we like decided that we would put, you know, one of them on stage with like the 16. So, and then we had another guy who had, um, like a 35 and, um, we decided that he would be best in the pit. So like, we generally base things around like um, different visuals. So like the back angle is pretty wide and it can pull semi close. It never needs to be super close because we have pit cameras for that. So and then in the pit, we've got me with the zoom lens, which is um, like a 12 to 35. And, um, I use that for all my like whips and pans and like doing interesting shots in the pit. I do a lot of dancing in the pit. I just move around a lot to give the film my look, like the look that I do. Um, and then generally the people on the sides, um, lately we've had a couple where, uh, shows where they're using Ronins, where they're using stabilized equipment, um, I opted that we do not use Ronins for Warp Tour. For one, it's extremely hot and it'll kill your back. And filming three sets back to back is undoable for most people. Uh, they will collapse uh, with a Ronin. So um, we do shoulder rigs. So we use shoulder rigs. And um, I generally, the people who are around me generally have longer lenses than I do. So if I'm filming with a 12 to 35, someone at least has to have a 35 and somebody has to have like a 50 or because we don't want a bunch of super wide angles in the pit. It just it'll throw things off. If you jump from a wide to a wide, it'll just look weird. Yeah. And it gives it some contrast between the shots. We've kind of experimented with that all over the years on like how we place cameras and the way that we do it. And, um, it all really just now it just comes down to just, we're comfortable with our gear and we just know what to do. You know, before it was like, 
unless it's like something big like last weekend for Warped, we had to plan things out with extra people. But um, when it's our normal crew, we just show up and we're ready to go. We all know what we're doing generally, so we're we're not so much noobs anymore. <laughs> That's awesome. And so what do you guys hope for the future of Caliber? Like what are you pushing towards? Like what what are your plans for the year, for the next year, the next five years even? Well, a lot of it's kind of under wraps right now. We have plans and we have some people that we're talking to um, to try to help us. Um, we've got like we've got a lot of people in Caliber and obviously AK who runs BBTV who do a lot of the decision making. And um, I would say that our our main thing is trying to make money because that like and not necessarily just money like we want to create amazing things while being profitable you know what i mean because at, at this point we sink money into it we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars and youtube money is not the bee's knees it's not and when you film live videos 90% of it is not monetizable, especially with the current state of our audio. Everything doesn't – we don't make money off of them. We make money off the old videos, but those don't have very much money to them. Like Chelsea Grin, 1.6 million views but zero money. So um, I think the main thing from us, like we will always put out content to YouTube – but we want to do more like DVDs. Like we want to do a DVD. Like we we had a chance to do a, a DVD with a band, um, but we didn't end up – they didn't end up getting it approved through the label uh, for the funding. So um, maybe on another tour. Um, but – you know that's that's really the main thing right now is moving into DVDs and um, other genres, for sure. Other genres. That's our our. I would say one of our main things that we're talking about right now. Um, we will always film metal and we'll always put metal videos out, but we want to also get into rap and we also want to get into EDM and um, you know we want to do pop and country and. We kind of want to do it all, but um, we got to start somewhere, and we haven't branched into other, any other genres yet. I mean, we've filmed, like I've filmed um, music videos for rappers, and I've you know done pop music videos, and like I've done different things, but we've never put in like to do live videos like that. So hopefully someday. Um, but as far as like building caliber up, we would love to be like the new MTV. I mean, in a in a all serious manner, we would love to be a hub for everything music. Like we would like to have people who do interviews, people, you know, who have talk shows, people who do stuff like you do where you interview and talk to people and podcast and you know like we we want to like have a mega channel if that makes sense totally. it's just we have to find the right people and um we really have to get a business like strategy down and how we're going to do it and realistic goals and achieve those goals you know like we have to like think about it like businessmen and like actually like figure out where we're going to go with things so it's it's kind of a process right now like you know everything takes time but we're hoping that we can eventually push out as much music content as possible cuz that's where our heart is we love music and live performances are the fucking shit and people should always <laughs> go to concerts always I agree. forever I agree so like seriously you you think there's a market for DVDs still I don't necessarily think that DVDs would sell 
maybe in a bundled package. There are certain bands that can sell DVDs. Slipknot, they can probably sell as many DVDs as they want. You know, One yeah. OK Rock can probably sell as many DVDs as they want. Um, but there are, you know, like Bring Me the Horizon, they can do it. They can sell DVDs. Yeah. But there are there are a lot of um, smaller size bands that I don't know how profitable that would be for them to do unless it was like a massive anniversary for a huge album. You know, like if Under Oath was doing like one of their albums, it would probably do pretty well, you know, but it, it just it has to be like a specific moment. Um, like, for instance, recently, um, the ghost inside coming back, that yeah. could have been a DVD. Yeah. Straight up, people yep. would have bought that all over the world. Yep. They would have wanted to see that night yep. forever. Should've people been would want to. I know. I wish, but people would have wanted to rewatch that. That's a moment yeah. in history that people will remember and people will look back on. So there are certain things that I do feel like DVDs could sell, but for the most part, no, I don't think the DVDs can sell. But there is always. Um, Streaming, like streaming mm-hmm. has become a huge thing. And, um, you know, bands put out live videos all the time. There's been multiple like live concerts that go up on the Internet that do very well. They get millions and millions of hits. And that just fuels the fires for bands like like it may not directly make the money unless they're selling something off of that. But the end return is way greater because, you know, you get thousands and thousands of people watching that video who've never seen that band before who now want to go see them live mm-hmm. or people who are, are thinking about it and they're just watching a video online and they're like oh my god i have to go to that that's insane i mean look at beartooth beartooth did all those live videos and those things are sitting with multi-millions and those are amazing you know yeah people want to watch that and people like reliving the moment and i think there's there's like a certain like there's a certain thing with music lovers like you leave a show and you can't stop thinking about it and you're still watching that band perform on the internet you know like how crazy is it to find a sh- a show that you attended you know and like HD that's insane mm. so i would say that um you know DVDs, kinda, and DVDs kinda. streaming, yeah. <laughs> in in short, in short version. In a short version, yeah. But also Netflix. I I want to do Netflix stuff. I have a couple friends who've uh, worked with some Netflix stuff, and um, recently I got offered to create an intro for a Netflix show. Wow! And um, all After Effects work. Um, but, um, you know, like there's, there's some people that I know who are interested in doing Netflix stuff. And like, I'd love to do something like that because Netflix has been doing, you know, live videos with like all these huge celebrities, like Chris Brown did one, um, uh, Taylor Swift did one. Um, there's a couple others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but they did insanely well. And you know, of course, they're renting out red cameras and they're, you know, p- pulling out Aries or whatever, and they're filming on high end cameras. But there are cameras that are capable of Netflix quality that you don't have to spend fifty thousand dollars on. Yeah. So, um, and to speak of one of them, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, that thing is actually, um. It says like the the quality that that outputs is capable or acceptable for Netflix. Wow! You can film a whole entire series on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera and get it approved on Netflix. It's actually a format that they they will take a quality standard, I guess, because it shoots raw. It shoots raw, and that's what they need the most amount of bit rate ever. Yeah. So, um, and that's not, 
that's not totally far fetched. The camera's a thousand three hundred dollars. I mean, yes, when you put all the attachments and solid state drives and you know, for all the storage and the batteries and everything else, it's probably like three thousand dollars. But that's still doable. Like if you can get a loan to do something like that, like that's doable. Yeah, and then you'll make it back. Times exactly. a billion. <laughs> I just wish that we could like go out with like Snoop Dogg and do a live video and be like, yo, Snoop, we got the best audio quality, I swear. <laughs> listen, Snoop Dogg, if you listen to the podcast for whatever reason. <laughs> exactly. You know, hit, hit or up, like hit up Caliber TV. Or please. like Keith Urban or some country yes, singer like Rascal Flats. You know what like, I mean? Exactly. Yes. Like that stuff, put it on Netflix. Let's do it. For sure. Yeah, do all raw. Yes. We'll make it um, insane. Oh, my God. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So what is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started? Something I know now that I wish I knew when I started. I wish that I knew file compressions and what it what it really like did when you exported out videos and exported them again. Oh, Yeah. That's a total noob mistake. But like if exported anyone's listening, it on top of itself, basically? Yeah, exactly. So like when we first started, we didn't know what we were doing. And when we first started color grading, like Fredo would just export out like an MOV or an MP4 and send it to me. And I would open it up and I would clip it all and color grade it and export it. And like the quality <laughs> would just turn to butt. You know, like it would straight up like it would look pretty good and then it would look kind of muddy and then like it would get <laughs> uploaded to YouTube and it'd be like, wow, what happened to the video? But, you know, we didn't know that at the time. So it took us years to f develop a, a way to do this. Um, and we actually I'll tell you our secret on how we s move all our files. Um, we transfer all of them to hard drives. So we all have hard drives because we all live hours away from each other. Well, an hour away from each other each way. So um, we all have the files. And when we export it, we use the project manager setting, export it into a folder like you're going to move it to a hard drive. And we delete all the footage files out. And you leave the folders and all the information that Premiere needs in order to know what it's doing. And um, – then we send it over the internet and it'll be like, you know, something that was like 200 gigs is now like 500 megabytes. And then we open it up or we put all the files back in and open it up and it just works, which wow. is amazing. Yeah. And Alfredo's calling me. He's probably at my house. Good. I need him on my podcast real quick. Hey, Kay. Hey, Fredo. What's up? Not much. What's up with you? Oh, uh, you know, just recording a podcast with your boy, but I had a couple questions that he couldn't answer, so oh, okay. I figured you could answer them. And Shoot. it's it's cool that you just happen to be here now, so that this can also be a part of the podcast. Sweet, I'm down. What right. you got? So, um, how do you go about getting a camera into a show? Like, how do you reach out to publicists? Where do you find their email? Like, how do you reach out to bands, you know, like what, you know what I mean? Like what is the process you guys go through for getting a camera into a show and speak for all the amateur photographers out there that are trying to get into shows? Okay. So typically for the first step is you go to their Facebook and you go to their about me section and you scroll down and most of the time they have their publicist listed on there. And or and or manager, whatever, but publicist is the actual way to go. So you get that email, send them off an email saying that you want to shoot uh, which day of the tour, what venue, um, what publication you'll be shooting it for. And uh, uh, links to your previous work, obviously, would help a lot as well. And, and then after that, it goes through the approval process and you get the, the approval. You should usually get a ticket and pass and... You're good to go. You're able to shoot the entire show most of the time. Sometimes certain bands will require their own pass, but most of the time you can reach out to most opening acts or even the headliner and you should get a photo pass to shoot the entire show. 
So go back to way back to the beginning before you had like a big portfolio or anything like that. How do you get a camera into a show? You know what I mean? Like, do you go through the venue? And yeah, there's some smaller venues like Chain Reaction where you can just bring a camera in. But what if I'm a newer photographer that wants to shoot at a venue where say I don't have a publication that I'm shooting under because I don't know anybody. How do you f- how do you find a publication? Like what like what are some what are some tips you you have for for newer photographers like that? Okay, let me think on this one because honestly, we kind of just brought cameras in. <laughs> like yeah. uh, at the very beginning, there wasn't any it was it's really hard at the very beginning when you don't have any like support any publication to to shoot under. Uh the way we did it was we kind of just brought them in, <laughs> but you can't really say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, most, uh, geez, how would you, how would you go about this, Tyler? I have no idea. What's the question? She's asking. Uh huh. Um, before, like before, we had any portfolio to like share. How would we get a camera in? Well, I would say that we we probably actually. Just we're shooting photos, and we used it to film video. Well, also you can even try <laughs> DMing a band directly. It's a more unprofessional way to go, but uh, yeah. most times bands uh, they're pretty chill about it. Uh, but that is, like I said, the more unprofessional way to go. Yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, the correct way is to message people. But we were dumbasses, and we didn't have this podcast to listen to, so we were completely <laughs> clueless. So we just kind of winged it and just did whatever. <laughs> then, we met, then we met Andrew at Assembly, and he changed our lives. By oh, that too, yeah. To if you can get in with like a venue manager, that's cool. They'll help you out a lot as well. We got lucky in the early days as well. Uh, back when we didn't have a portfolio, I guess that's the answer. Yeah, just getting good with the yeah. the local staff. Uh, most of the time, they need photos for their social media accounts as well, so yeah. they'll be happy to give you a pass if you promise to supply them photos for their accounts as well. Yeah, guys, something I've learned recently: get in with the venue manager or get in with the security guards. They're gonna let you in if they work there. <laughs> or you know, cross their eyes the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. One or the other. <laughs> One or the other. I'll let you and like wrap this up. What is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started Caliber? Okay. What is something that I know now that I wish I knew back when I started Caliber? Professionalism goes a long way. <laughs> That's for sure. One thing is uh, uh, even like when you're starting out, always have a very professional uh, mindset. Don't act amateur because other people will see you the same way as well. Uh, be confident in your own work and yeah that's something that you may not feel at the very beginning but it's definitely something that you need to have in your mind constantly is that uh yeah it's not the professional you never know who's going to see and you yeah. never know what opportunity is going to be around the corner that you, you can mess up potentially by saying the wrong thing or not doing the right thing mm-hmm. yeah, social media will literally destroy you if you don't watch what you say. So true. So very true. All right. So for everybody listening, where can they find Caliber TV and their socials? And if they want to potentially hire you to film their show or their maybe their music festival, I don't know who's listening to this podcast. It oh, is, yeah. We're definitely up for music festivals for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash official Caliber TV. Uh, Caliber TV on all social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Snapchat even. We're all over the place. And if somebody wants to potentially work for Caliber, maybe go shoot a show. Like uh, Tyler was saying earlier, sometimes you will uh, let people shoot under Caliber TV as a publication for shows. Like, How can they get in touch with you for things like that if that's an opportunity that you uh, allow? Okay. Uh, we have a contact form on our website on CaliberTV.net. It's uh, I think the tab is actually just contact us, and uh, that sends us a direct email to whatever, and you can send in uh, if you want to shoot for us. We're always constantly looking for somebody to cover shows, festivals across the country. Uh, just send us your link. We'll check you out, and we'll give you a, a reply and tell you what's up. Hey, maybe, you guys, maybe I'll just start hosting shit for Caliber TV and just be a correspondent. I don't know. We'll see what happens.
I'm down. Let me know. <laughs> down, dude. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get we'll that. We'll talk after this bread. call. Run. I'm down. All right. Cool. Well, that was another episode of Project Freelance. Thank you for checking it out. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a rating of five stars and leave some feedback for other people so that future potential listeners read your feedback and then check out the podcast, which is probably what you did. If you guys want to follow Project Freelance on social media, it is on Twitter, Project Freelance, without the... uh, it's freelance. There's no freelance. There's no A after the L, A, and C, E, you know? It's just Project Freelance because on Twitter, you're limited to how many characters you can have as your username, which is unfortunate. But on Instagram, it is Project Freelance, and on Facebook, we have Project Freelance. Um, go check those out. Thank you, guys. And to let you guys know, I have new music with Chasing Satellites coming out on August 4th. We have a new single dropping called Houston, We Have a Problem, a new single and a music video. So be sure to look up Chasing Satellites. If you didn't know, I'm also an artist. I'm a singer and a metal screamer. I have been for since I was like 14, 12, 12 or 14, 14, I was 14. So yeah, if you guys are into uh, music, really dope, badass music. Go check out Houston. We have a problem on August 4th. Thank you guys for listening to this podcast. I will talk to you next week on Project Freelance. I will actually be coming to you from Rhode Island. So I hope you guys enjoy that episode. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you then.